Hello, my name is Rick Houston, and welcome to the Scene Vault Podcast, your source for all things NASCAR history. Presented by QWare. Maintain excellence. The day NASCAR and all of us associated in any way with NASCAR forget its past, that's the day we don't have any future. Jeff, 2002, you go winless for the first time since 1996, and you part ways with Frankie Stoddard, who was yep. your crew chief. And from the way that the next week's Winston Cup scene read, <laughs> um, it, it was, you know, obviously <laughs> – um, it was pretty much your call. Uh, how difficult was that season and that move for you? Well, it was really difficult. And it was also, you know, I've talked about the things that, that I went through. And that was one of those things that I went through. And I didn't handle it as well as I should have. You know, we had had a – Frank and I had had a conversation, you know, quite a bit before that. And I had said to him, look, we have to – if you know, if we can't get going, we're going to have to do something different. But that was all that I ever said. And Frank deserved more than that. And and um, you know Frank had uh, Frank had moved down. You know I was a huge Frank Sauter proponent um, and defended Frank. You know many many times with with uh, with Jack and with with other people. And um, you know I was I was I was the reason that Frank was here because I saw in him what I saw in him. And I worked I worked a long time to get Frank to move to come down south. And finally, when the 99 thing happened, he did it. And uh, I just a ton of confidence in what Frank could do. And, and uh, we, had a, we had several young people that we had to decide who was going to be the crew chief. When, when Buddy wasn't going to be the crew chief anymore and he was going to be the general manager when we moved Mark into the, into the team, into the shop with us, which that's a whole other story. But, but – um, and so I, I picked Frank. And when I picked Frank, there were some people that got upset at me that thought they should have been the guy. But he was a guy I thought was right, and we won a lot of races together. And, and to this day, I think Frank, if I owned a cup team, I would – I don't Frank might not work for me, but if I owned a cup team, I would, I would call <laughs> yeah. Frank, and he would be my strategist. Like, I'd have him – I'd have him – he would be my strategy guy. And if he said pit, we're going to pit. Because I think Frank was one of the – the very best strategy guys in the in the history of NASCAR. He was just f- unbelievable at it, and and really really competitive guy. Uh, but unfortunately, we just weren't running well. We would and we had not run well long enough to where we had to do something. And and um, you know that guy's been me before as a driver, and and in this case, it was it was the crew chief. And and uh, but. We had to do something, and 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 it, but but that did not get handled as well as it should have, and most of that was on my well, on my shoulders. Yeah, a couple of years later, in 2004, you run part of the season without a sponsor, and then in August, you leave Roush Racing and Ford for Richard Childress and Chevrolet. Yeah, now that was a seismic <laughs> change in the garage area. And for you in particular. So what was going on behind the scenes for all of this? Well, we still hadn't been running well. And and we went from being, you know, you mentioned that year we won all we won some races and uh, I think we won two races and but we I was the only driver at Roush to win. And then the following year I was the only driver at Roush not to win. And that continued. And uh, we were the worst team. And and uh, just couldn't seem to get the ship righted. Um now, I will say this, um, we started to get it. Like, we started, I could see it and feel it. We were starting to get there. Uh, the opportunity with Richard came. Uh, and, and um, you know, it was just the right time. It was, it was time for Jack and I to do something different. And um, I believed in my heart, and Carl Edwards, I called Carl Edwards myself. And I said, dude, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to Jack. I'm going to work for Richard. You need to drive a 99 car. And he's like, what? And I told, I told Jack Roush. I told Jeff Smith. I said, that's the guy. Well, he's not ready. I said, bullsh- he's ready. <laughs> I'm telling you, he's ready. And I, you can ask my wife and you can ask Russell Branham. We sat in the office of my, my office in my house. 
when I made the decision to go to Richards, and I told both of them, looked them both in the eye, and I said, here's what's going to happen. And I don't want to hear anything from you two. For the next 18 months, we're going to get our ass handed to us. Period. End of story. And I said, but we're doing this because it's time for us all to do something different. Jack needs a different look. I need a different look. The, the challenge that Richard had given me, I, my voice was starting to not be heard at Roush because I hadn't been successful. Richard was go, willing to give me that voice to do more than just be a driver, which is what I would, that's what would make, that's what I, I had success. I had success by not just sitting in the seat and being a driver, but by being part of the process. And that had quit working at Roush. But I knew that Carl Edwards and that team was going to kick my ass. I knew it. I told them, I said, it's going to take, it'll take a year and a half to get it where we need to be. And it did. And, and, and I took an ass whipping for, for 18 months. <laughs> and, but I yeah. went, we went to Vegas the off season, went to Vegas off season test. And we had run about a half a day and Mark, we were in one garage and Mark Martin was testing in another garage and I, and my phone, I'm out of the car and my phone's ringing and it's Mark. And he said, uh, he said, you finally got it, don't you, bud? And I said, what do you mean? He said, I'm down here, y'all hauling ass. He said, you you finally got what you need. And I said, dude, this stuff drives really good. And from then on, we started kicking their ass. And but it took it. It took 18 months. I shouldn't say kicking their ass. We 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 had great battles. Right. We had great battles. Well, 2006 and when at Dover, now ended a winless streak that went back nearly five years. Yeah. Now. How often, if ever, did you maybe doubt yourself or your abilities during those five years? The biggest thing that I doubted was what I was feeling. You know, Jack Jack said to me one day, he thought my assometer was messed up. <laughs> <laughs> and it was hard to argue, right? Because I couldn't make lap time. Like, I couldn't figure out what my strength had always been was – I felt what I felt, and I made the changes or asked for the changes, and we would go make that happen. And I couldn't – I didn't know what I – it just, just wasn't working. So that was my biggest concern was if I can't feel what I need, I can't be successful because Mark Martin's better than I am. i got to find another way to beat him. And, and uh, that was really my biggest concern. And, um, but – but I always, but at the back of my mind, I always knew well, if we get these cars to drive the way I want them to drive, they will feel the way I wanted them to feel. And so that was the that was the internal struggle. It really wasn't. I didn't question my ability. I questioned was I able to re take the information and process it and provide the feel that I needed to be able to make the lap time. So anymore. obviously, the relation next question, which is, what did it really mean to you personally to win that race? Well. You mentioned it. When I left Roush, that was a big deal. And then on top of that, I immediately went. I left Roush. I, was, I was, wasn't running well there. I immediately left Roush, went to Richards. The car I was driving is beating me every single week and running well. And um, this put that behind me. Uh, now, that win, we had been running well. Yeah. You know, we had been running well enough. So we were – that's typically what happens, right? You typically run well, then you win. You don't win and run like crap unless you just catch a break. But um, it, it, was, it was the confirmation. That, you know, how do I say this without sounding bad? I, I, so many drivers came to victory lane that day. It was raining like hell. And there were so many drivers that came to Victory Lane that day to congratulate me. And, I mean, hell, I, I, it's emotional talking about it. That meant, that, that meant so much to me. Um, and the respect of those guys, I, it matters to me. The respect to, even today, when I walk in a cup garage today, I want the drivers, the current drivers, crew chiefs, crew members, their respect is what I quest. That's, their respect is what – and for those drivers, for Jack Roush, for – former teammates, competitors come to Victory Lane on a day where it was difficult for them to come to Victory Lane. That that just meant that meant a ton to me. More than more than anyone will ever know. You eventually get sponsorship from Caterpillar. 
Uh, did Ward ever come to you and attempt to teach you how to properly say <laughs> cat skid steer loader? Cat skid steer loader. I can do it. www.catskidsteersuitcaptivitloader.com One of the best of all time. Yeah, that's one of the best. That That is... You know, it's funny because, like, people think that was a, that was staged. And I'm like, no, that's Ward. <laughs> Just go to their website, www.catskierloader.com, or head over to the Carolina dealer. That's Cat Skid Steer Loader. It's all one word, right? Cat, cat Skid Steer Loader. <laughs> <laughs> If you don't know what we're talking about, just do a Google search for Ward Burden Cat Skid Steer Loader, and it will John provide Boy and Billy. Yeah. about two minutes of fun. <laughs> One more time, it's Cat Skid Steer Loader. I can't say it. I've tried. It's just... <laughs> <laughs> well, Jeff, you win races in 06, 07, and 08, and you're in the top ten in the final standings each year. Uh, but in 2009, the team has a pretty big drop-off in results, was there anything in particular going on, or had it simply gotten that much harder to be successful? Yeah, on the racetrack. That's you know, that's I don't know. Um, you know, in the, the, the so within those times, you know, we went to we went to Martinsville with a big point lead, with only like four races left in a year, and I remember, I think Junior Junior made a comment after the Charlotte race that I was a new ice man that they, no one was going to beat us that we were going to win a championship and I felt that way too good night for us we didn't gain on uh, the new ice man Jeff Burton but uh, I mean you can't break him he's just uh, they're there every week doing a great job and uh, you know you kind of got to pull for him a little bit to win his championship but and we went to Martinsville and blew a motor wow yeah and yeah. and now we left there like I don't know, second or third in points. Then we go the next week to Texas and blow a tire. And that was my last that was my last chance to win win that championship. And and um we were in great position to win that championship. We had tremendous speed. We had Scott Miller and I were on the same page. Like we were I knew it wasn't over, but I knew if it just came down to competition, we were going to win. And because of what we had, what we had done, and we were we were so close. But when we broke that motor, and then went to Texas and blew a right front tire, it was over. And that was my, you know, my goal going to Richards was I wanted, I wanted to put Richard Childress Racing back, not in victory lane, back in the championship. Because what Dale and Richard had done, that was my goal, and and uh, that was that was the most disappointing thing that we weren't we weren't able to make that happen. We had it; it was in, it was there for us, and we just we just things that were. I honestly feel like things that were out of my control and Scott's control. You know, we just couldn't pull it. We just didn't make it happen, and that that's the most disappointing thing about all that. Jeff, 2010, Texas. Uh, I don't guess there's any two drivers that would have been more surprising to see start duking it out other than you and Jeff Gordon. Maybe Lake Speed and Morgan Shepard after a <laughs> MRO service or something. <laughs> <laughs> Who won the fight? That wasn't a fight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If you're scoring, if you're on the scorecard, it's hard to score something that wasn't a fight. This is a pushing match. But I did tell – I. Uh, you know, and and that was um, that was one of the low lives, some low life, you know, lowest moments of my career. Really? Yeah, that stupid altercation. Because um, I mean, the whole story behind it is we were both pissed off because we were running yeah. like 18th. Yeah. And and um, you know, he I was running the high line, he was running the bottom. He thought I should let him let him go. He made a big swerve at me because he was mad. And my temper got the better of me, and I stood wide open in the gas. I wasn't trying to wreck him, but we got hooked up. And once we got hooked up, we couldn't get apart. And and when he hit, I mean, he hit really hard. And and as soon as he hit, like the energy, all the energy, you know how mad you get and how, you know, all that went away. And I was concerned that he was hurt. And, I, and wow. on top of that, I yeah. knew what it looked like. Yeah. You know, yeah. and if you yeah. watch that and you don't think that I intentionally wrecked him, you're blind. 
And, and, but I didn't, but I knew what it looked like. And I knew my anger had put me in a situation to put him in that situation. And, um, it was, it just wasn't, it was, it was not at all what I am. You know what I mean? And I felt like you dumbass, you know, your temper got the better of you. You put somebody else in jeopardy and you made yourself look silly and, and, you know, all uh, my, my, uh, my reputation, I felt like my, re- who I was, was not demonstrated on that day. And it was one of the low, one of my low moments. Well, what I was going to say is what wasn't surprising was the fact that you, uh, immediately manned up and on TV immediately afterwards, you said, I, I messed up. Uh, I, you know, we just got hooked up and you know, all that. So you immediately took kind of the blame for that. Well, you know, we both were at fault at it, but because I made the the final contact, I was the most at fault, and it's just it is what it is. And and uh, yeah, that was that was. Uh, I mean, it's kind of funny now, but at the time, it wasn't. You know, it just wasn't. And and um, I was uh, one a funny story is uh, Mike Helton called me a few days later, and he says, "Hey, look, we we, you know, we're looking at this thing. I need you to tell me what happened, and you know, we might have to we might have to." to fine, make a fine here or some kind of punishment. And I, I immediately, I don't even know where this came from. I immediately said, dude, I don't think you ought to fine him. I don't think you meant to do it. <laughs> Mike, boy. Mike kind of Mike kind of chuckled. He kind of chuckled a little bit and laughed. <laughs> to this day, I don't know. And I think that saved me probably fifteen or twenty thousand. But <laughs> Well, 2013 was your last full-time season, uh, full-time behind the wheel. At what point did uh, television first enter the picture? Oh, gosh. Uh, So um, everybody had me doing TV but me. Like, if you remember, a lot of people were saying, he's going to go do TV, he's going to go do TV. I hadn't had any conversation with anybody about doing TV. Uh, some conversations did start, um, but way after other people were were anointing me as the next TV guy. Um, so when uh, Richard and I sat down and we had a conversation that it would it was probably in everybody's best interest. So I was going to run one more year. I wanted to run one more year full time, and then I was going to retire. And um, and I, at that point, when Richard and I sat down and had a conversation, and it was in his best interest uh, for some business reasons, uh, for some competition reasons, that I didn't run that next year. At that point, I had started to have some real vague, like not nothing at all, but but some conversations about possibly doing TV. Um, it all started to get put together because now I had a I had a year that I had planned on racing that I wasn't going to race, and what am I going to do? And and I didn't see with you know no one was going no major team was going to hire me. I had no interest in running for a, a smaller team. Just wasn't at that point in my life, and um, so that's when it really became serious, and that's when. I was really able to to start spending real time talking about it, um, but you can't race and do TV. But but my my plan was, and this all happened after the fact. Like I wasn't talking to TV when all that happened. But if you look, if I were to run that last year full time, the next year was when NBC was going to come in. So it all was going to lay out really nicely. But what ended up happening was when Richard and I made the decision, it allowed me to spend a year uh, diving into television and doing NASCAR America and understanding more how it worked. And so that was actually, you know, like I said with Carl Edwards, it was time for Jack and it was time for me. It was also time for Richard and it was also time for me and it was time for TV. It all merged to where we all, it, everybody came out the winner. And and so I've had that happen to me twice in my career, where you know everybody came out better. Uh, Richard went with Ryan Newman; they had a really good year. They had good sponsorship. Uh, I went was able to 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 
to do TV and learn. So it was a win for everybody. And, you know, I've had that happen to me twice where everybody won. How long did it take you to adjust to watching and talking about the sport rather than being down on the track yourself? Was there a period of maybe withdrawals? So I was terrified about not driving and, and, um, and still wanted to drive. And, and, uh, but, when, but when I started, so when Rick Allen and I went to Connecticut, so my first, the first show I did for an NBC was their very, very first NASCAR America show. And it was going to be the Monday after that Daytona 500. So in uh, the, the Olympic, Winter Olympics are going on. So I go to, I go to the Daytona 500. I go down there, but I'm sitting in the Orlando airport when they're dropping the green flag in an or, in a Orlando airport restaurant. And I'm like, what in the hell is going on? Like, they're going to start this race without me, right? <laughs> I, I, and here I am going to get on an airport to go to Connecticut to talk about it. And that was my, oh, crap. But when I got to Connecticut, and it rained, it rained. So I got there, and I was able to do the show and, see, and, and, and sit down with Rick Allen and sit down with the production crew and watch the race together. And at that time, I said, you know what, I'm, this is, it's a different team, but it's a team. And how are we going to do this? And so I went, in, went into to the, the studios on Monday, and typical me, there was some stuff in the studio. I didn't like how they were doing it. Like they had a, they had a, uh, and this is nothing against any particular driver, but they had uh, uh, numbers on the wall, right? And they had the 10, which was Danica. They had uh, uh, the 88, which was Junior. They had, you know, the popular, and I said, how, what's the deal with these numbers? Well, that's, I, I know whose numbers they are, but, but why are they up there? Well, they're the most popular. I said, to hell with that. They got to earn it. <laughs> That's right. Like yeah. the top yeah. five on that board are the top yeah. five from the race. Yeah. Like I don't give a damn who they are. And so, and I'm flexing my muscles a little bit just to see how big they are, right? Yeah. And the, the guy's like, okay, that's cool. I like that. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to fit in here. Right? Because <laughs> cause I don't, I, I can't, I can't and don't want to be part of something that I'm not part of. Like I have zero interest in getting on TV and talking about only what they show. If I can't be part of what we're going to show and if I can't be part of how we're going to do this, I don't want any part of it because that's just my personality. And, and NBC is just this incredible fit for me because everybody in, everybody in, I don't care if you're a producer, if you're a director, if you're a commentator, if you're a cameraman, everybody can have an opinion. And I love yeah. being part of that. That's great. Uh, just a, sort of an off-the-wall question here. From you? Surely yeah, not. from me. Jeff, you once said something about going into politics. Is that still a possibility? Still in your mind? Somewhere? So, sort of, kind of. But, um, and, that, and, you know, what that comes from is that, you know, I didn't serve in the military. I didn't, you know, I left high school and went and built race cars and, and um, I didn't, haven't served my country. I haven't, I live in the greatest country in the world, and I don't feel like I've served it. And so I, I feel a pull to want to do something for the country. And at that time, I thought politics made a lot of sense. Today, I don't. Um, you know, being older, and, and I don't, I think maybe I can impact in a different way other than politics. But I want to serve my country. I want right. to, I want to, uh, Listen, I love what I'm doing, and I want to do, you know, my friends are in the garage. My, you know, when I go to the, I don't, I don't, on a Thursday, do damn, I got to go to the racetrack. On a Thursday, I'm like, I get to go to the racetrack. Yeah. And, I, you know, I, as long as I feel like that, I want to keep doing this. But when, when either they won't have me any longer or that drive isn't there anymore, then I want to do something to, to serve my country uh, because I think we live in the greatest country in the world. Do you have a picture of what that might be I at don't. this point? I don't. Okay. Yeah, I, 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 um, I really don't. I, I, you know, I, I, um, I'm just, I'm, I'm a very blessed person. I love what I do. I work with people that I, that I, I love and that I have good relationships with. Um, and I, I'll, I'll be damned if I'm gonna take myself out of that situation. You know, I mean, I'm just happy and and. And I'm proud of, I am really proud of what we do on Saturdays and Sundays. I'm proud of the effort that goes into it. 
And you know, listen, some people didn't like Howard Cosell, and some people loved him, right? There's people that, that like what I do, and there's people that don't like what I do. But what you never question is the effort. And, and no one will ever question the desire, the effort, and the teamwork. I mean, our team, you know, I spent 15 minutes on the phone this morning with Steve Latart talking about, we're not covering races right now. I spent 15 minutes with Latart talking about, you know, about the race last weekend. And that's, that's you know, we care, we like it, we enjoy it. And I'm proud of, I'm proud of what we put on TV. I really am.